डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी देशबंधु कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली इंडिया गुड आफ्टरनून एंड अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ ऑर्गेनाइजिंग टीम टू द थर्ड डे ऑफ थ्री डेज इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार सीरीज on understanding flora from aquatic ecosystems towards better conservation and sustainable use organized by department of botany deshbandhu college university of delhi india in joint collaboration with institute of ocean and earth sciences university of malaya malaysia the talk sea grasses as faunal habitats advocating for sea grass conservation via ecosystem services in session 1 of day 1 by dr jillian oelin sim from department of geography university malaya malaysia was very informative and interesting too stress was laid on ecosystem services provided by sea grasses and sea grasses as a habitat for faunal species sea grass hotspots and threats to sea grass enriched habitats were brought to limelight presenting eye catching sights dr rupesh bhumia from science center for international forestry indonesia enlightened the participants with tropical peach swamp forest in session 2 of day 1 he not only talked about what how and where about of peatlands but also insisted upon the role of peatlands in climate change not only this peatland conservation and restoration was an eye opener for we all mangroves are one among the uh, most productive and bio, uh, biologically important ecosystems on this planet providing ecosystem goods and services to the mankind Day two was a day of mangroves, where in session one, Dr. Sadev Sharma from Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University Malaya, Malaysia, highlighted the facts about global distribution of mangroves, their adaptations, restoration, and conservation. The beautiful pictures of mangroves were eye feasting for we all. A virtual tour to Sundarbans in session 2 of the day by Dr Krishna Ri from Department of Botany West Bengal State University Kolkata India was mesmerizing various species of mangroves were introduced threats to indian sundarbans uh, mangrove ecosystems and major anthropogenic drivers of mangrove degradation drew the attention of audience it was a great pleasure to listen to all the speakers of last two days after two days of insightful sessions here we enter the closing day of the webinar series without taking much time i cordially invite our internal quality assurance cell coordinator dr aditya saxena from deshbandhu college university of delhi india to deliver opening remarks for the day sir we are honored to have you with us over to you sir thank you dr anju uh, and now uh, i would like to welcome you all to this final day of the three day international webinar series so on behalf of deshbandhu college i dr aditya saxena extend a warm welcome to the distinguished dignitaries and participants of this three day international webinar series understanding flora from aquatic ecosystems towards better conservation and sustainable use uh, to the final day session which is jointly being organized by the department of botany deshbandhu college under the aegis of the internal quality assurance cell and the dbt star college scheme of deshbandhu college and the institute of ocean and earth sciences university of kuala lumpur malaysia i especially welcome our distinguished speaker for the session professor nabiul islam khan forestry and wood technology discipline 
Khulna University, Bangladesh. Sir, it is indeed an honor to have you amongst us over here today for this lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to give a brief introduction to Deshbandhu College, especially to all our uh, foreign participants and collaborators. Under the dynamic leadership of our honorable and respected principal, Dr. Rajiv Agrawal, our college has achieved many milestones in the past three years. The most notable amongst them being that our college was awarded the 96th rank in the All India Colleges category in the National Institutional Ranking Framework 2020. And we have organized more than five international conferences in the past two years, more than six international festivals and webinar series in the past one year, and more than 50 workshops, conferences, symposia, and seminars in the last one year. It is heartening to see that as part of our conservation and ecological sustenance efforts, the college is poised to be awarded the Green College and has made significant progress in the area of energy conservation and uh, natural resources conservation. And this has been possible because the college has adopted the green building norms has implemented rainwater harvesting in its campus as a composting pit in the campus, a botanical garden, and now we are developing a bonsai garden also in our college. Apart from this, we have also organized a 21-day international yoga festival and numerous society and student engagement programs through our NCC, that is the National Cadet Board and the National Service Scheme units. Our library has been adjudged as the best library of the Delhi University by an independent jury. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, conclude and say that uh, once again, we extend a very warm welcome to all the participants, especially the international participants to this webinar series. And I would uh, again hand over the platform to Dr. Madhu to kindly continue from here. Sorry, Dr. Anju to kindly continue from here. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us and motivating we all. Now I call upon Dr. Preeti Rawat from Department of Botany, Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, India, in my and introduce the speaker of this very session. Over to you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you so much, Dr. Anju. A very good afternoon to one and all. It's my proud privilege to introduce our first distinguished speaker for today, Professor Mohammad Nabiul Islam Khan. Professor Khan completed his BSc in Forestry from Khulna University, Bangladesh in 1997. He completed MS in Chemistry, Biology, and Marine Science from Faculty of Science, University of Rikus, Japan, in the year 2002 under the Medex scholarship funded by the Government of Japan. Subsequently, he obtained his PhD degree in 2005 on marine and environmental sciences from the University of Rikyu's Japan under Mon Bukhaga Kusho Scholarship. He was awarded the prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellowship from Germany from the year 2009 to 2011 for pursuing his postdoctoral research. He was also awarded FNRS, National Science Foundation of Belgium Postdoctoral Fellowship from the year 2011 to 2013 for advanced research. Professor Khan's research interests include creation of virtual forest, forest growth modeling, ecological modeling, carbon sequestration, canopy radiation transmission, forest structure, species diversity, and ecosystem functions. Professor Khan has published several research articles in Scopus Index Journal in the field of forest biomass inventory, carbon assessment, simulation modeling of forest dynamics, and their utilization in forest management. Presently, Professor Khan and his team is actively involved in various research projects aimed at the better understanding and restoration practices of mangrove ecosystem in Bangladesh. With this brief introduction, I would now like to invite Professor Khan to deliver his talk on the topic, Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, and management in the Sundarban mangrove forest of Bangladesh. Before that, I would like to uh, make an announcement that the audience, uh, they can post their queries in the chat box, uh, which would be taken up at the, you know, after the talk. So over to you, sir.
हेलो reconnect my pc to another network i have network uh, problem here hello anybody can unmute and uh, talk that you can uh, listen to my speech yes sir you audible sir uh, it is audible yes so, sir so i can continue right yes yeah right yes sir, right. sir. So, thank you because uh, i i was having a connection problem uh, internet connection problem and frequently it was reconnecting so i was trying to connect my computer to mobile network so now i am using a wifi network in my house so if i disconnect never mind so i will connect it again with my mobile network so this is reality <laughs> welcome to my presentation so i will share my screen uh and then i will uh, start my presentation share screen i hope you can see the full screen of the top page of my powerpoint uh, slide yes sir it's visible anybody can respond okay so i i will continue from now on thank you very much uh, i would like to thank uh, dr shahid shah good friend and we worked in the same laboratory in the japan and uh, we we have the same supervisor of uh, our phd so i am privileged here to get invited here and today i will talk about the biodiversity uh, ecosystem services and management in the mangrove forest bangladesh uh, who are not from the mangrove ecology or mangrove science or forest science department there are some other people so i will make uh, my presentation so it will be more about uh, generalized uh, uh, subject on sundarbans mangrove for sustainability uh, let's Uh, already uh, this slide was in 1992 afterwards i uh, went to japan for, for my uh, master just phd and i went to germany to for post doc excuse me sir sorry uh, sir your uh, sound is not audible properly here so if you could uh, just uh, switch off your uh, video i think the bandwidth will be better and we could would be able to hear you better sir stop video now my video has been stopped and um, i hope it will be the audio will be better now so i will go to full screen of my it's much much better sir okay thank you okay so uh next i went to belgium for my another postdoc and my i'm working as a professor in forestry and wood technology in discipline kulna university bangladesh so in my talk i and uh, uh 
uh, overview of my interest and I think uh, Dr. Khan got disconnected. Uh, we should be a uh, little patient. Uh, he will join uh, quickly again. Uh, I'm really sorry, I was disconnected from my network. So I had to connect my mobile. Uh, anybody can respond? Can you hear me, please? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. It's uh, okay, sir, it's not in your hand. These are the uh -huh. shortcomings of technique, technology. Okay, yeah, Sometimes that's, we that's have to bear with it. Yeah. And it's very unfortunate that I was disconnected from my network, Wi Fi network. Now I'm using my mobile network. So I hope things uh, will be better from now. So uh, welcome to my presentation once again. Uh, I came back to my last slide, the source of data that I used uh, for my presentation. Uh, the first, the BFIS, Bangladesh Forest Information System. We have the digital information here about uh, any forest um, and documents that is published by Bangladesh Forest Department. And next is the IPAC data. The, this is a project by European Commission and also a publication that I am a co-author, like Wetland Ecology and Management, the Rahman et al. Uh, excuse me, sir. Sir, kindly share your presentation. We are not able to view your presentation. Uh, you are not uh, seeing Share it? screen. Share you screen. Have to share your screen. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Share the screen. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, sir, it's visible now. You can carry on now. Thank you, sir. So um, I also used uh, the integrated resource management plan, and the data of uh, Sundarbans uh, for, from Bangladesh Forest Department, and also used the data of SEALS project, the Sundarbans Environmental and Livelihood Security Project. Uh, 
I also use uh, some data that is published in Malaysian Forester, which is also from the SILS project data. And also finally, the use a uh, government of Bangladesh Forest Department 2020 that we already had a Bangladesh forest inventory. So Bangladesh forest inventory, it includes the information about any forest in Bangladesh throughout the country, including Shundurbans. So all this information I will use uh, partially in, in this presentation. So uh, this is the forest area of Bangladesh, including the uh, country map. On the bottom side, you can see the green color here, it's uh, Shundurbans. And we have also hill forest and uh, some mangrove plantation in the coast area here. So uh, I will talk about, I will focus on Shundurbans uh, mangrove forest uh, of Bangladesh part only. So you must know that the Shundurbans is a single track mangrove forest uh, in the world. This is the largest single track. I got this map from the Google map. And you can see this is an Indian border, Bangladesh and India. The left part is an Indian Shundarbans and right part is Bangladesh Shundarbans. The total area is about 10,000 square kilometer, uh, 6,000 square kilometer in Bangladesh and about 4,000 square kilometer in India. So that we are very fortunate that this kind of mangrove uh, still exists in Bangladesh and India. This is a very rich mangrove rich in biodiversity and uh, many other things. So I will focus about uh, Bangladesh part of the Shundarbans. You can see a map uh, in this slide and you, you can see uh, three different colors of uh, Shundarban. The green color is a fresh water zone and a yellow color is moderate saline zone and, and uh, the reddish color is a strong saline zone. Why the salinity is different? Because uh, because of the fresh water flow. Uh, Bangladesh has a connection, Padda River is connected to the Ganges of India that has a fresh water flow. And that flow is directly coming from uh, this Eastern part of the forest. So this area receives a fresh water flow. And there's a pointer. Okay, this area receives a fresh water flow and uh, this uh, western part uh, does not receive such a fresh water that's why this zone is a uh, always strong saline zone but in rainy season the salinity uh, becomes very low but in summer or in winter season the salinity becomes very high in this zone so overall this salinity differences make a huge difference in the overall biogeography in this uh, Shundarban mangrove forest of Bangladesh so I will focus about it uh, in the throughout my presentation. So uh, the first part, uh, floral diversity uh, in the Shundarbans. Talk about the plants. Uh, this map uh, shows uh, the distribution of uh, species, mangrove species in the whole Shundarbans. And in this uh, map, you can see the Shundri is a Shundri is a hereditary forms this is a the most dominant species of this forest that's why the forest is named after this species shundar bon shundri is beautiful so beautiful forest is shundar bon and you can see this uh, area is dominated by shundri and this southern part in the shatkira near india this part is dominated by the gewa and goran so we are coming to the scientific name of this species so you can see the species differences uh, that are dominant in different parts. Some part is uh, dominated by bine and some part is Kaora, some part is Goran, and uh, this part is dominated by Heritaria from the Shundri. And in the bottom uh, side near the seaside, you can see some uh, marked uh, here. This is a wildlife sanctuary. Shundarban West Wildlife Sanctuary, Shundarban East Wildlife Sanctuary, and Shundarban South Wildlife Sanctuary. Three wildlife sanctuaries, they are protected areas and managed to preserve the wildlife and wildlife conservation purposes. So that's why we declared, the Bangladesh government declared this as a wildlife sanctuary. Now, uh, this screen shows the mangrove species of Shundri, Heritaria forms. 
which is the, the forest is named after. Uh, the tree is very tall and uh, it makes a buttress formation on the stem on the bottom side and also makes uh, many, many new metaphors on the soil surface for the soil respiration or the root respiration. And you can see on the left screen, you are seeing the Nipah pruticans. Uh, it means uh, this is a, a palm, palm a plant in the sugar bonds that are frequently found. And this is used for a testing material by the local people. And on the right side, you are seeing the Sonoracea apitala cavra, uh, the pure crop of cavra, matured uh, site. The data I'm going to present uh, in the next slide is the SEALS project data. We have 320 nested plots data all over the sugar bonds. And this data, always we have uh, two positions. Every point has two positions near the river and within the forest. So we are going to see the differences of a species composition near the, within the uh, river, near the river and within the uh, core area of the forest. What is the difference? So every sample point has two different samples. So, uh, and we also had a transect uh, line. So overall, we can see the species and differences. We have 52 tree species within the forest, having uh, 187 of total species, including tree, harp, shrub, climber, fern, orchid, palm, and uh, creeper. So if we see the transect line, it has a, 187 species. If we see the sample plots, then we have 131 species. So transit line has a uh, more species uh, to be observed. It depends on the, it has a relationship with the area that you cover in the sample. So overall we can say that uh, 187 uh, plant species that are found uh, in this uh, forest. So, and uh, you can see the sample area that we have covered uh, for a tree. We have covered 30 hectares of land in the sample. And uh, for pole, about three hectares. For sapling, about 0.8 hectares. And for seedling, a small area. So overall, we uh, get 131 uh, plant species that are found uh, within the Shundarbans, Bangladesh. And uh, also it has a family uh, distribution. Within this uh, hereditary forms is a Shunduri. This is the most dominant species from Straculaceae family uh, for uh, tree species. And we also have uh, information about the non-tree plant species. So within the non-tree plant species, we have uh, Deris indica, we have also Acanthas, we have also Pandanas, Nipah fruticans, uh, so Acrosticum, so all these plants are non-tree plant species and uh, heritage is a Shunduri, Gawa is Exocaria agalotsa, Goran is a Seriop dicandra, Amur, Jailocarpus. So these are mangrove tree species that are found. The star marks indicate the trees that are found in the canopy. It means the big trees are found. Okay, next uh, slide. This slide explains the how many species tree species and non-tree species, plant species that are found uh, within the forest uh, in relationship to the sample size. So if we increase the sample size until 320, then it's found that about 80 uh, species are about uh, for plant species and about more than 30 uh, species are about sampling and pole and Timber species is a more than 25 uh, timber species that are found. Timber or uh, tree species that, that forms a big, bigger size a tree. And uh, this slide indicates the, the species uh, richness and diversity indices and uh, uh, of uh, overall Sundarbans in different uh, salinity zones and in different uh, regions and also in the river uh, stream condition. So when we consider the stream side just near the river, then the species richness is 129. If we go to the forest uh, core side or proper habitat, then 67 species are found. So 
uh, stream side is because this is a mangrove species and uh, mangroves are normally uh, regenerated through water. That's why near water, they are uh, dominant. Afterwards, when the forest uh, proper, it has to pass through a lot of succession and the plant succession process and it makes the species number limited in the forest uh, core area. So when you consider the salinity zone, so low saline zone has a higher number of species than the higher saline zone in, in the western part. So this is eastern part. And this is also clear by the area, Sharankula in Bagarhat and Chatpa in Khulna, Khulna range and Shatkira is near India. So near India, the Shatkira part has 45 species overall and uh, Sharankola is near Bagarhat, the eastern part, it has uh, about 100 species. So uh, biodiversity index, uh, let's say Shannon index, also uh, the 3.3 in high saline zone and 3.83 in low saline zone. You can see also it increasing with the salinity. So salinity makes a, a difference in, uh, in Shundurbans, Bangladesh, about the species uh, distribution and uh, its uh, richness and uh, diversity index. So overall, uh, dominance of a species, which a species is uh, most dominant? If we see that overall study site, uh, Shunduri is uh, the, uh, contains 43% uh, importance value out of 100. And, and the next is Exocaria agalocha, Xylocarpa mekongensis is also uh, there in the, in the top five. So this is overall Sundarban, but if we see the stream side, when the stream side uh, is considered, then Sundari is only 32% importance value index. Uh, and uh, if we consider the forest proper, it means the core area of the forest, it's a uh, 53% uh, importance value index of the Sundari, the most dominant species of the forest. So overall, we can see the hereditaria forms, Exocaria galocha, Jalukarpas, Mekongensis, Sonoracea, Pitala, Kaura, and Abyssinia officinalis is a bind. And Kakra is Brugira, Zimnoriza. This species and Abyssinia, Jalukarpas, and Rhizophora. This species mainly dominates uh, the Sundarbans forest. And however, the number is uh, very limited, except few species like Shundri, Gawa, Poshur, Kaura, bind. These five species uh, makes uh, most dominant coverage the stream side and uh, overall uh, also. Okay, now the, the history of uh, plant species distribution uh, in the Sundarbans. Mm -hmm. I, I move this part here. Okay, so uh, history of plant species diversity in Sundarbans. Uh, the brain, uh, 1903, very uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, it was invented by the Indian government, that time the British uh, India. The entire Sundarbans was uh, under the study and it found that 334 uh, plant species is there. And uh, the number actually uh, fluctuates and uh, it, it's reducing day by day. Uh, in the recent uh, survey that we have found in 2014 by SEALS project, we have found it. 187 uh, plant species, including mangroves and non-mangroves and uh, creepers, any kinds of plants, 187 uh, species. So it indicates that um, after 100 years of time, uh, the, some species are already um, extinct from this uh, forest. Okay, uh, now I make comment about the biodiversity, the hereditary forms, Exocaria agalocha, Abyssinia officinalis, uh, and Sonoracea pitala, Jalocarpus mekongensis. These five species were the most dominant tree species in Shundurbans. And uh, some uh, non tree species like uh, Deris indica, Phoenix, Paludosa, Acanthas illicifolias, and Pandanas, and uh, Sarco lobas uh, also were uh, the don dominant uh, non-tree plant species on the forest floor. So on and ever is the top 10 uh, species uh, of tree and top 10 non-tree species, the other plant species makes actually the 92% of the 
of the total number of individuals. So if we consider this, that the 92% and the cover of the plants are covered by only 20 tree species and all other three species are only few that are found. Only 8% are made by other uh, 170 species. So the plant diversity uh, and composition are approximately two times higher in the stream side than in the forest uh, proper or the territory of the, the core forest. The species diversity in the eastern part of the Sundarbans like Sharankhala Chatpai was higher than the western part, the Khulna and Shatkira. The species composition between uh, low and medium saline zones was similar, whereas the, the, the T, these two uh, zones were dissimilar with the high saline zones. And uh, high salinity zone has a lower species diversity than the low saline zones. And in the next part I, of my talk, I will talk about the ecosystem services uh, received from uh, Shundurbans, Bangladesh. As we know, uh, ecosystem services has uh, three major uh, uh, classification like provisioning service, and directly gives a financial benefit like a timber, fuel wood, a thatching material, fish, crab, honey, etc. And cultural services like uh, ecotourism and some religious uh, uh, matter. And finally, the protection services. So three kinds of services are classified in the ecosystem services. So Sundarbans actually gives all of these uh, services. Let us see some uh, direct uh, measurements of these kind of services that we uh, see uh, in this uh, uh, slide. This is published in Ecosystem Services in 2013 by Uddin. So he found that about uh, annual average revenue of uh, different uh, ecosystem services, especially the provisioning services like honey, wax, crab, and thatching material. Uh, fish and uh, timber. And from 2000 to 2010, this 10-year uh, period, we can see this uh, diagram. It's interesting that timber and fuel wood, this kind of things, uh, services are becoming low and other services are becoming, this is the change, the percentage of change in total annual revenue. So 13 times higher uh, crab production has been happened from 2001 to 2010. And opposite happens to timber and fuel wood. It means the, the collection of timber and fuel wood is uh, reducing within this time period because of some management. We are coming to that in the later. So ecosystem services uh, data says that 72% of the collectors are engaged in fishing, followed by 52% in fuel wood and 32% in crab collections. 55% collectors depend on Sundarbans resources for about 76 to 100% of their annual income. So about half of the people depends on these people are near uh, Sundarban, not all over the country. Those people who are living near Sundarban. So collectors average income uh, from fish is about 390 US dollar followed by the crab, uh, 290 US dollar. You can see some uh, uh, image on the right side of collecting uh, fuel wood and other uh, services taken uh, from the forest. So this survey was taken by the government of Bangladesh, uh, BFI, Bangladesh Forest Inventory. So uh, this inventory found that every household surveyed, they received at least one service from the trees and forest. And 65% of the women are involved in collecting uh, primary trees and forest products. And 54% of the households received medicinal benefits from the forest. They also measured uh, the percentage of uh, households that received these services. 
it means almost every people almost 95 percent people receive a shade from the forest these are the services that they receive and about 90 percent they receive the natural wind break next is the pollution control they also receive the medicine soil fertility erosion control livestock grazing tourism recreation religious activities fresh water supply and many others so all these services uh, are received from the uh, forest neighboring uh, community so total annual income uh, from the trees and forest uh, trees and forest contribute only 1.29 percent of the gross national income however trees and forest provide nine percent of the annual income in the Sundarbans periphery so within the Sundarbans, uh, they provide the uh, nine percent of the annual income so this uh, uh, also says the the fishery product the shrimp fish and crab contribute more than half the total value of the Sundarbans periphery so mainly uh, shrimp, fish, and crab, they are collected from Sundarban and it makes the economy in this uh, half of the economy. So economic value of the primary products uh, from trees and forests. It's found that the, the figure in million BDT. So one US dollar equals to 85 BDT. So 300,000 million BDT that are received from the forest as a fruit, fruit production and leaves production, timber, fuel wood, bamboo and other fish, shrimp and crabs. So it indicates that significant amount of uh, economic uh, values are received uh, from the forest and uh, trees. And also from the, it includes also some non-timber uh, forest products, non-wood forest products like uh, bamboo, honey, uh, broom, thatching material, uh, bamboo shoots, mushroom, and other things. So uh, next I will uh, talk about the, the above ground carbon uh, distribution within the sugar boss. This study was uh, performed uh, by uh, performed from the data received from the IPAC uh, and I recently analyzed this data and uh, recently published this information. So above ground carbon you can see that the Sundari dominated uh, area in the western eastern part has the uh, highest amount of above ground carbon and uh, it's going down uh, the minimum in the western part of the forest. And uh, below ground carbon is also related to the above ground carbon because it's a root system. Uh, next is a uh, soil carbon. Soil carbon has an interesting pattern. Uh, the highest amount of soil carbon is found on the, uh, the lowest amount is found in the coast area. And uh, this is the outside of the coast. Although the plant size is shorter here, thus the soil carbon is stored uh, in a similar manner. The Shunduri is dominated here and Gawa, Goran is dominated here. These are the dwarf mangrove and these are the very big mangroves. But uh, some area has a soil carbon, a rich uh, soil carbon stocks. And overall ecosystem carbon stocks, uh, including soil, uh, is distributed uh, like this. That is turned as has a higher amount of uh, ecosystem carbon stocks, about uh, 600 ton per hectare uh, around here and about 100 ton per hectare in the western side. And uh, this difference is also calculated by, uh, also related to the salinity zone, the freshwater zone, moderate saline zone, and strong saline zone. They are significantly uh, different uh, in above ground carbon, below ground carbon, soil carbon and ecosystem carbon and how about the comparison of ecosystem carbon in uh, throughout Bangladesh Sundarbans to other forest areas so this uh, uh, column indicates the Sundarban and this is a coastal forest hill forest hull forest and other so it indicates that the 
Sundarban has the, in comparison to others, Sundarban has the higher amount of carbon stocks in Bangladesh. So ecosystem uh, carbon stocks, uh, the time, uh, shift with the time. If we consider uh, the 23 years difference or 30 years difference, so you can see this uh, diagram, uh, this uh, table. It indicates that on an average, uh, the annual carbon uh, sequestration is 4.8 million ton or megaton per year during 2010 and during 2020 also. Uh, we have a similar amount of total uh, annual carbon sequestration megaton per year in the whole Sundarbans. So on an average, we can see that uh, about 4.5 uh, to 4.8 uh, megaton per uh, year is uh, annual carbon uh, sequestration. It means uh, normally we, we think that if a forest is a natural forest and uh, it, it's, uh, the growth is very slow, but uh, Sundarbans is still growing. Although the growth is very slow, but uh, it's still growing in the same rate in the last, uh, in 2010 and 2020. So uh, I think this has happened because of the management uh, system of Bangladesh. Recently, Bangladesh has changed its management system uh, to more conservation uh, and less uh, production. So in the list, uh, next slide, I will talk about the management of Sundarbans. Before describing the management of Sundarbans, uh, I would like to say something about the history of management. It's a very old history, starting from the Mughal uh, period. The Sundarbans uh, exist in 1203. That time, the local kings, they leased out the forest of Sundarbans. The Sundarban has a heritage and long time history of management. So the area was first mapped in 1764 by East India Company. And then uh, it was under Forest Act 1865, declared as a reserve forest. Afterwards, uh, after uh, when the Pakistan government came, 1959, the Khulna New Sprint Mill using the Exocari Agalocha Gawa as a raw material. So we produce a new sprint mill new sprint from this uh, mangrove forest. And also we uh, make a particle board or fiber board from the dominant species, Shundri, hereditary forms. We make a uh, Khulna hardboard mills was uh, established in 1965. Although these mills are currently stopped because of the raw material shortage and the government uh, decision about uh, the harvesting of Shundarbans. So, Historically, uh, the forest is management managed uh, is under management, uh, and especially uh, when we we make a harvesting, we make a minimum felling of garth, 90, uh, 91 centimeter during eighteen ninety three, and it was gradually increased the the exploitable garth size to one hundred six centimeter. Uh, in the later part, 1909 and 10. And afterwards, the Cartes makes a, another management plan, 1931 to 1951, the 20 years plan. Afterwards, when the, the Bangladesh and India formed, uh, the, the Pakistan and India formed, this plan is still followed, the Cartes plan. is very important management plan. So uh, gradually we are improving uh, the um, conservation and it's related to the forest management. So in uh, 1960 to 1980, we had a, uh, include the harvesting plan for Khulla New Spring Mill. And afterwards, the government has stopped uh, the failing from Sundarbans. 
the government declared a moratorium on the felling of timber from the natural forest 1989. The felling of gawa and fuel wood, however, was exempted from this ban. So still, uh, we, uh, the felling was done for Kula New Spirit Mill. So Kula New Spirit Mill has been closed on November 30, 2000, 2002, due to shortage of raw material. After that, the felling has been stopped and uh, the felling of Shundri is also stopped during 1989. And 1998, we had a integrated forest management plan, IFMP, for 12 years. Uh, still, uh, the government has a little uh, felling plan uh, on the paper, but in practice, the felling was uh, stopped. And finally, uh, the, uh, in 1995, the government declared the 10 kilometer wide band surrounding the northern and eastern boundary of the Sundarbans, area about 175,000 hectares. This area was declared as ecologically critical area, ECA. So it includes five districts and 10 upazilas and 100 and, uh, 1,300 and uh, 02 villages. And approximately 4.5 million people lives within this area, including 17 sub districts in the periphery of Sundarbans, including the Bawali, Maoli, the wood collector, Maoli is a honey collector, and uh, Zele is a fish and crab harvesters, non wood collectors, and uh, Chunari, the, the snail collectors. So, uh, Afterwards, uh, 2010 and 2020, most recent uh, management plan, the Integrated Resource Management Plan, IRMP. This IRMP had uh, five goals. The goal number one is to protect, restore, and sustain and enhance the biodiversity of Sundarbans. Goal number two, the resilience-based uh, food security. So we get uh, benefits, products, and services in a sustainable way. Goal number three, the enhanced ecotourism. Goal number four, the community-based co-management approach. Co-management means we uh, include the local people or the forest dependent people or the neighboring people uh, in the harvesting process and conservation process. Goal number five, we provide the appropriate climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, options. So uh, the protected area co-management uh, approach uh, we accept and this co-management committee was formed. This committee has two parts, the co-management general committee and co-management executive committee. And these committees are formed by the village conservation forum, the, the mangrove dependent community, and mangrove independent community, and mangrove surrounding poor people, people's forum. And we have some state actors like the, the government organizations, and also some non government organizations like and civil society, people's forum the indigenous community and uh, the forest resource users. So all these people makes the co-management committee, the general committee and executive committee. So this is the structure of co-management uh, uh, process in the Shundarbans. Co-management means uh, we will include the people in the, into the management process so that the, the, the resource can be managed uh, in a environment friendly uh, way and uh, to ensure its uh, sustainability. So Bangladesh is still uh, fortunate and having high richness of flora and fauna in the Sundarbans reserve forest. However, there is a growing concern over the anthropogenic uh, disturbances uh, in the Sundarbans. That's why the forest department is concerned to tackle this situation uh, using the co-management committee and also provide the, the alternative livelihood 
to the Sundarbans uh, user group in cooperation with the NGOs. And recently, the GIZ, the German government, funded the Smart Approach Spatial Monitoring and the Reporting Tool. So you can see the about uh, the Smart Management um, with the website of GIZ, the German government, uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation of Germany, GIZ, and BMZ. So this project is still running until 2022 in cooperation with Bangladesh Forest Department. So they mainly make uh, the smart spatial monitoring and reporting tool for uh, sustainable management of the forest. This tool actually collects, stores, and analyzes the data of illegal activities, the biodiversity, and patrol routes, and fishing gears. And experiences will be used for a national strategy for smart. It means not only Sundarbans and other forest area also will be covered by a smart monitoring approach. So conclusion, uh, the Sundarbans Bangladesh is now managed for conservation of biodiversity to ensure its, its uh, sustainability. Production and extraction of timber is neglected and non-timber forest products are managed in a sustainable manner under co-management approach. So now, uh, in short, I will talk about my uh, research interest. I normally work on forest-based uh, statistical analysis, forest ecology, forest carbon assessment, allometric equations, biomass and forest growth estimation, simulation modeling of forest growth and biomass, forest mensuration and inventory, and forest management. Uh, recently, I have uh, formed a new uh, simulation model so I think I have taken already a lot of time. So I will skip these slides. And these slides actually explain the modeling, why we make modeling. Uh, if you see this slide, it, you can see the two different tree. And uh, this is called individual based model. And one tree is uh, related to, the growth of one tree is related to its neighbor. It means if the, the tree is smaller, it has laser impact on the bigger tree. If tree is bigger, then it has a higher influence on the smaller tree. So this is actually competition, uh, individual tree competition uh, based model. And this is called a field of neighborhood. When the tree is a neighbor to another tree, it has an influence on growth. Based on this, we, we make a model. So there are three models already published in mangroves and I, I propose a new model. That model is, looks like this. And you can put your raw data here and some model coefficients. And then you can get uh, the artificial forest like this. If it is a single species, a regular distribution, then you can uh, run this simulation with a particular growth uh, or a research question. And then you can make a simulation. And if this uh, slide indicates the monospecific irregular forest the um, structure. And if the species is aggregated, then it indicates the monospecific aggregated forest. And this is a mixed species, a irregular forest. So this can be created virtually in the computer and uh, we can make a experiment and we can make, a, after that we can extract the data and analyze the data to see the impact. Like uh, this, uh, this is an example when we make a, a simulation model and this is a, the original data indicates the black uh, uh, circle and the white circle indicates the simulated data. So we experimented the tree density reduction when the competition happens with the growth and time. So it follows the, the on minus 1.5 uh, slope of uh, self thinning process when the trees grow. This is published in Biogeoscience 2013. <clears throat> it's called Pattern Oriented Modeling. So virtual forest experimentation is very useful uh, uh, for silviculture options of forest management and biomass growth prediction, forest carbon stock dynamics, and in the next slides, I will uh, see you, show you some publications that I have uh, published recently from my research group. 
the global ecology and conservation about the leaf morphological and anatomical plasticity in Shundri, the most dominant species in Shundurban, along with different canopy light condition and salinity zones in Shundurban. You can see it to the global ecology and conservation webpage for the details. And uh, another re relevant publication from Shundurban is uh, about the carbon stocks in the Shundurban's mangrove forest. I was a co-author with my student here. And also, this is a, a biogeoscience, the paper I already showed, how the tree uh, make competition and they stand dynamics that leads to a special pattern of uh, monospecific mangroves. I also made an experimentation on uh, a mangrove uh, simulation about different uh, sampling techniques published in PLOS, Public Library of Science. And I was a co-author of this group. And I also made uh, this uh, simulation model to know the how the, the threat can uh, destroy forest and how the mangrove can recover. So using uh, some expert knowledge and also using the simulation model to define the mangrove composition functioning and threats and estimate the time frame of recovery. So this was done by Mukherjee, Nibedita Mukherjee from uh, Calcutta. We worked together in Belgium. And another publication is from Global Ecology and Conservation and the Allometric Relationship of Stand Level Carbon Stocks uh, of nine tree species in Bangladesh. And I was the leading author here. All my research group is here. Next is, uh, I also uh, published another work on a simulation model of PCQM, the point center quarter method. This method is about uh, the plant density estimation. Uh, using the four distance in a point, the nearest uh, four trees in each quadrant. Then you can make the how many trees per hectare or how many plants per hectare or per square meter. So I evaluated the, this uh, PCQ method and, and having a more accuracy than the original method. It's published in a plus one. 2016. And lastly, the forest ecology and management about the allometric relationship of uh, non mangrove species as mahogany, Suetonia microphylla. And also, allometric relationship of this is a trees, forest, and people. In most recent publication, the journal pre proof, only a few days before. It's also published, uh, accepted in the journal trees, forest, and people. So I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. And if you have any question, uh, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Khan, for an enlightening lecture on various aspects of Sundarbhan Mangu Forest of Bangladesh. As we all know that Sundarban span from the Indian state of West Bengal to the Khulna division of Bangladesh, so in order to protect them from degradation and for their effective restoration, a collective effort from both the countries is needed. In the present lecture series, uh, like yesterday we heard Dr. Krishna talking about the restoration work done on the Indian side. And sir, today you have given a very uh, nice insight into the species composition of Sundarbans in Bangladesh, the ecosystem services they provide, the forest management practices that are followed uh, to protect these uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. So the simulation modeling to predict virtual forests that you talked about was indeed very interesting. Thank you once again, sir. Indeed, it was uh, it was indeed a pleasure to listen to you. Also, with your kind permission, can we take some questions from the audience uh, who have been posting their queries in the chat box? Okay. Uh, so. The first question is from Vikram Kamlesh Sehrawat. He is asking, how does ideal amplitude influence a mangrove forest canopy and atmosphere greenhouse flux footprint? Now I'm checking the question. Uh, how does the tidal, 
uh, amplitude influence influence the mangrove forest uh, canopy and the atmosphere greenhouse uh, flags greenhouse flags flags uh, footprint. footprint yes sir the tidal uh, amplitude uh, in fact the, the the tidal amplitude in bangladesh is uh, very high in some places in the low tide and high tide the difference is actually tidal amplitude and uh, the, the difference is very high. Sometimes in some places in Bangladesh Shundurban, the, the tidal amplitude is about five meter. So, and uh, some places very flat uh, ground uh, near the seashore, uh, the, the tidal amplitude is very low. And I think this, this tidal amplitude is uh, very important for uh, future of a mangrove an atmospheric uh, greenhouse flax footprint, if you say, think about that. There are many studies that they have uh, forecasted that if the greenhouse effect really uh, comes and the sea level really rise, if it's on meter um, or 50 centimeter is higher than the present uh, situation, the most of the uh, area of Shundurban will be submerged because the, the overall Sundarbon area is uh, flat. And uh, at that point, the, the, the Sundarbon, uh, scenario of Sundarbon will be different because the species composition of Bangladesh Sundarbon uh, depends on the salinity. And if uh, the, the tide level is higher than the present uh, condition, then the salinity level will uh, change. And that will uh, be a big threat on uh, the, the keynote uh, keystone species, the Shundari, because it, it loves a fresh water area, not the saline zone, and is absent uh, in the higher saline zone like Shatkira and the western part. There's another question from Pat that what would be the reason for the low occurrence of rhizophora, especially in the saline region? Uh, in this is a good question. Uh, there are some species that have a, a salt uh, association with the salt level. Uh, we, we can see that Abyssinia marina, this is a diverse species, and you can see you can find this species uh, globally and uh, the, the maximum rich mangrove area. But the Rhizophora species is very popular in Malaysia, especially for plantation, as far as I know. But in Bangladesh, uh, the rhizophora species is not uh, dominant because in the eastern part we have uh, uh, Shunduri is dominant and in the western part is a Gawa and Goran is dominant. But rhizophora is uh, distributed uh, throughout the forest, but uh, only few number. I have already said that uh, about the importance value of different species. So rhizophora is uh, among the top 10 species. So, uh, in my uh, view, the rhizophora species occurrence with respect to the salinity, uh, it has not been explored. It has really relationship with the salinity. There may be other relationship. Uh, that's why the, the rhizophora cannot dominate in Shundarbans because always the, in the fresh water zone, Shunduri is uh, the dominant. Maybe relationship with the canopy light and the soil conditions and the, the reproductive power and the competition capacity. There are many things will uh, make this decision. Uh, there's another question by, again, by Kamlesh uh, uh, Vikram Saravat. He's asking what aspects or parameters of mangrove forest is most affected if people will use its timber for charcoal making? Uh, charcoal making is very interesting. Uh, in in my knowledge, uh, the Shundurban, uh, the species of Shundurbans, the Shunduri is very high density uh, timber. The Shunduri wood is very slow growing tree and it takes 100 years to make a matured tree and to get about 100 centimeter girth, about 100 years. So it's very slow growing species and the wood density is very high. Normally, charcoal is made from the low density wood, uh, the fast growing uh, timber species. So in Shundurban, we have fast growing species like Kewra. 
Kevra is a very big uh, tree and pine also is a very big tree. These kind of trees are suitable for uh, charcoal making. And uh, Gawa, it has some wax uh, in the uh, stem, in the bark. So that may make it uh, difficult. But the Gawa was used in the Kulna new sprint uh, production, paper production. There's a question by uh, Mr. Umkar Koshti, he's asking, Bangladesh is rich in deltas, so what is the status of mangrove apart from Sundarban deltas? Okay, we have a huge um, coast uh, from the Cox's Bazar, Chittagang, Noakhali, and until the Khulna, Sundarbans. So we have a very big uh, coast. And we have, uh, Sundarban is uh, about uh, uh, six uh, lakhs uh, hectare, five lakhs, 70,000 hectares. And similar amount of area is covered by uh, mangrove plantation in Bangladesh. So uh, throughout the coast. And the, this plantation has been done uh, by the forest department of Bangladesh. And we call it a greenhouse, uh, green belt uh, project. Green belt means we make a, a, the mangrove tree cover throughout the coast. And there are some uh, area that are not suitable for mangrove uh, cover. So that are neglected. but many areas we have a mangrove plantation. So recently I have a project, uh, <clears throat> the ongoing project to estimate the, how much uh, carbon that is, has been stored uh, outside the Shundarban, the mangroves, uh, like the mangrove uh, plantations. That plantation actually uh, only few species like uh, Keora, the Sonarashi apetala. This is the fast growing uh, species, the pioneer species that you can uh, plant these species in a new or uh, fresh uh, land newly formed uh, Chor Island, you can make this species. And uh, that's why the Kevra is the most dominant species in the plantation of uh, coastal areas of Bangladesh. Uh, there's a question by Harsh Sharma. He's asking, it is heard jute has also a major part in economy of Bangladesh. Is it true? I think he's asking whether plantation of jute crop has any adverse effect on the Sundarbans, if, if I'm not wrong. I think this is what uh, he's trying to ask. The jute, uh, jute is, uh, I, as far as I know, jute is uh, not a saline. Um, a, a jute doesn't grow in the saline zone, like uh, intertidal zone. This is like a rice cultivation, and jute is also cultivated in the fresh uh, water zone. And there may be some varieties they can grow in the saline zone. So jute has no competition with the mangrove plantation in Bangladesh. Uh, there is a question by, by again, by Vikram uh, Kamlesh Shehrava. He's asking, so do you know any medicinal plants in the uh, mangrove habitat? Yes, uh, there are some uh, medicinal plants in any natural forest in uh, in Bangladesh or in any country because the, the natural forests are uh, composed of many, many kinds of plants and some of them has medicinal value. But uh, I have no expertise in this field, but definitely there are uh, many 187 species and only 20 to 30 mangrove tree species and uh, all of them uh, remaining part is a plant. And uh, there are some plants that has a uh, uh, medicinal value, but I don't know specifically that which uh, has this particular medicine. Uh, uh, there's a question by Mr. Santosh Kumar. He is asking, what is the status of genome sequencing of Rhizophora mucronata? Uh, uh, this kind of genome sequencing is not uh, done yet in Bangladesh. We, we, our laboratory is not working in that. We have biotechnology and we have a pharmacy department in the same faculty, but uh, they, are, they are also in fact doing some medicinal uh, experiment uh, from mangrove leaves like uh, Rhizophora and uh, other mangrove species. They are isolating some alkaloids uh, that are found in the mangrove leaves in Shundurbos, in pharmacy department that I know. And uh, I, I don't know about any zen, xenome sequencing about any mangroves in Bangladesh so far. All right, sir. Sir, uh, there's a question by our convener, Dr. Sehdev Sharma. He wants to ask, why do you think higher salinity has lower carbon stock? 
Okay, this is a very simple co correlation in, in Bangladesh Sundarban. The highest salinity zones, especially the Shatkira part near uh, Indian uh, border, this zone has only few species like uh, the dwarf mangrove species, like um, the Gawa and Goran, the Seriops and Exocaria. So these trees are only dwarf tree. They cannot make a full canopy or very big tree. On the other hand, the freshwater zone has the most dominant species is Shundri, Hereditaria forms. You can get 30 meter to 40 meter tall uh, trees. And uh, another tree is a uh, uh, Kaura, Sonarashi Apetala, the, the pioneer species. You can get this species throughout the Sundarbans, but uh, sporadically. And in the newly formed land, uh, they are the dominant species. So the Kaura has very high uh, carbon stocks. But in the strong saline zone, because it is dominated by Gawa and Koran, that's why the carbon stock is low. Because the tree size is very dwarf. They cannot grow to the sky or very big uh, canopy formation. That's why the canopy, uh, the carbon stock is also lower. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, there's a question by Mr. Devidas Papadnis. He's asking, how many rivers are there in Sundarban? Uh, I I forgot the exact number, but the the, the many many uh, rivers. Many rivers. There's a question by again by Mr. Uh, Sahadev, uh, Dr. Shahadev Sharma is uh, asking how do you compare future of Indian and Bangladesh mangrove in the next 50 years? Uh, I think uh, as far as I know, the Indian government is also thinking about the conservation of the mangrove forest, the heritage forest, because we have the we have a, uh, the species, the Bengal tiger that is residing inside Sundarban, and I'm sure. If the that Bengal tiger is missing from Sundarban, the uh, the people, uh, the greedy people, uh, will destroy the forest. Because we have we have experience of other areas uh, of Bangladesh. We had a very nice uh, 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 cover of natural forest, but afterwards the forest has been the area has been um, taken by the local people, and uh, the forest cover has been destroyed somehow. Uh, because of the pressure group and many other groups, the illegal uh, use of the forest. But because of the tiger, the people cannot live within the forest. They enter the forest and, and they have to get out of the forest at the night time. So, or at least they cannot uh, permanently settle within the forest because of the tiger. So conservation is very important for Sundarbans, for Bangladesh and for India also. And in the next 50 years, I think the the forest uh, is uh, actually uh, a matter of proud for India and Bangladesh. And I think both countries will, will maintain the strategy of the conservation of biodiversity and uh, the, the pride of this Shundarban in the coming years. Uh, there's a question by uh, Mr. Pat. Uh, he's asking how much of mangrove replanting has been done in Bangladesh and what species uh, are planted? Uh, about um, more than 500,000 uh, hectares of plantation uh, has been done in Bangladesh. And the most species is uh, Sonarashia apetala, the Kaura the most dominant uh, species in the pioneer uh, species in Sundarban. If you have any newly formed land near Sundarban or Chor land, uh, within the Chor land, you will find uh, that Uri, Uri, ghash, Uri grass, the, the newly formed Chor land, there will be uh, the first species that will dominate the area is a grass. And after grassland is formed, then the Sonarashi Apetala Kaura is, uh, will take the place. So if there is a lot of thousands of seedlings of Kaura is growing, then it will dominate for uh, several years. After that, the, the site will be modified and some other species, uh, mangrove species can come within the shade of the Kaura. 
So this idea was used in the mangrove plantation in Bangladesh. The Sonaracea apitala is the most dominant uh, species. And sometimes we also use a vine, the Avicennia um, officinalis. Uh, this uh, this uh, related question to this, uh, has there been much studies on recruitment of fauna within the replanted mangroves? Recruitment uh, of fauna. Uh, within the replanted uh, mangroves, uh, because the replanted mangroves are uh, not near the Sundarbans and the management is also different. Some case we have the participatory management like the, the participants uh, who are living near the plantation, they have a benefit uh, sharing mechanism like uh, they have to maintain the forest or they have to uh, protect the forest from the threats and afterwards uh, they will get some benefit from the forest department. So benefit sharing mechanism, uh, uh, and these kind of things are practiced in, in Bangladesh. We call it a participatory uh, plantation. So after the plantation has been done, uh, when the plantation has been matured and it has been harvested, after harvesting, the some amount of money will go to the, the forest uh, uh, owner, like forest department, and some amount will go to the, the participant. So benefit sharing mechanism. So this kind of uh, practice is also there in the coastal uh, mangrove plantation management. All right, sir. Uh, there's another question by Dr. Me today. She's asking, is there any change in the livelihood of the local people in the area with mangrove? Change in the livelihood of people? Uh, actually, the livelihood uh, of the local people, they are living near the Sundarbans. In my experience, I have experience of uh, going Sundarbans since uh, 1992 when I was a student. And uh, it's a long experience. In my experience, I have seen that the people uh, who are living near uh, Sundarbans, uh, they have a limited amount of uh, income. And some people, they are dependent on fishing, the mostly uh, fishing from Sundarban. And uh, some, they collect crab, and uh, some people collect uh, thatching material, the nipa fruit can leaf, and some uh, fuel wood also uh, collected by them. So these kind of things, uh, they uh, it cannot make them uh, rich. And uh, only uh, for living, they do this practice. And uh, some people are uh, attacked by tiger, and maybe there is a life threat. The, when they inside enter the forest and uh, they don't know the they will come back alive because there is always a life threatening uh, issues in Sundarban. And within this um, adverse environment, uh, they live only to survive. And uh, the overall livelihood is uh, similar as uh, 20 years before. The, the, the livelihood condition is not improved that much. But presently, the government is thinking to give uh, alternate livelihood and the alternate income source, uh, like uh, fishing has a time period and uh, also crab has a time period and honey is every time it cannot be collected. So those people who collect honey, they sh should give uh, another opportunity when they have no job. So alternate uh, livelihood. These things are normal now uh, done by the GIZ, uh, German uh, cooperation with Bangladesh uh, Forest Department. Uh, there's a question by Dr. Madhurani. She's asking, on an average, how much time uh, does it take to restore a mangrove vegetation in a degrading area? Oh. Huh. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, repeat the question, please. Yeah, I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that, sir. Uh, Dr. Madhurani is asking, on an average, how much time does it take to restore the mangrove vegetation in the degrading area? Time, uh, an average time to restore for a mangrove forest after replantation. It's uh, when uh, the mangrove plantation has been destroyed and uh, you have to make it normally 20 years uh, average time is required to uh, restore. Uh, so with this, sir, I, I would uh, thank you for patiently answering all the questions from our inquisitive audience. Thank you once again, sir, for being with us and delivering such an informative lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, sir.
and now i would request uh, dr neha neha yadav to uh, to take the session forward over to you dr neha dr neha Neha, you have been unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Preeti. Good afternoon, all. On behalf of the organizing team, I, Dr. Neha Yadav, welcome you all to the last and the final session of this three days webinar series. Hope you have all enjoyed the session till now. Well, moving forward, I would now like to have the privilege of introducing our final speaker of the day. Dr. Gurmeet Singh. Dr. Singh is currently scientist, Futuristic Research Division, National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. Dr. Gurmeet completed his MSc and PhD at the School of Environmental Sciences, JNU. He has been working in the domain of coastal biogeochemistry for last 15 years. He has worked extensively on carbon burial and nutrient dynamics in coastal ecosystem. With several research papers in his hand, Sir has been actively involved in various projects throughout his lifespan. So without further ado, I would now like to invite Dr. Gurmeet Singh to deliver his talk on significance of seagrass ecosystem from an Indian perspective. And I would uh, ask him to share his knowledge with the audience. Over to you, Dr. Gurmeet. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. It is okay. visible. Yeah. Uh, then I will start. Already it has been, uh, I think, previous session, the, a lot of discussion about the SIGRA systems are there. But here I would like to take uh, exclusively from the Indian perspective. What is the status? How in the how uh, in India SIGRA systems are there, and how it is conservation status is there, and uh, all the other detail. I will go in the much detail um, as the uh, presentation progresses. To just begin, I am working as a scientist in Futuristic Research Division in National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management. It's it's a new center established by government of India. Uh, we just completed our 10 years. And um, the center is based at Chennai. And uh, it's uh, taking care of the, all the policy, research, and other things, whatever uh, is associated with the coastal zone, whether it's a mapping, whether it's a research, whether it's a pollution assessment, or a policy framework, or mapping of fishing space, or everything. Everything uh, it has been taking for in the coastal um, uh, environment and i would like to since it's a department of botany is organizing i will just like to take another few minutes to just show you that we have developed a, an interesting app for the researchers who, uh, who are working in the taxonomy or uh, uh, biological identification of a species if anyone is working in a coastal and marine environment national center uh, for sustainable coastal management that ncscm has developed an unique identifier app uh, that here, in case, uh, if you go to a field, any layman without any knowledge of or without any background of taxonomy, it can go and it can identify whether uh, the uh, whether it's a uh, it, it takes a species and it sees whether it's a plant or whether it's an animal, and it just clicks it. That then, uh, oh yeah, it's a leaf like, it's a grass like. Then grass like, what is the structure of the leaf? What is the how the leaf look like? Leaf look like whether it's a serrated leaf. If the serrated leaf is there, then I, it will be either halidule or samodacea. So similarly, we can narrow down. And the uh, uh, beauty of this is that they, this is available in mobile phone, where user can click the photograph and then upload it and then get it verified whether the species what he has identified is 
correct or not so uh, being uh, uh, I, i see many of the students of botany are there if they are interested they can go the, to the ncsm website and download that app and there is a contact detail of the scientist dr deepak sembal is also there if they want further detail they can contact them it will be quite useful for those who are working in the field and uh, do uh, on site uh, taxonomical classification of the species now coming back to my presentation yeah uh so um, as ma'am has already introduced me i will not take much detail here uh, in ncsm i am working on climate change mitigation uh, and coastal ecosystem blue carbon studies and how the nutrients are uh, behaving in a in the, in the estuaries and in addition to that i am also working on the waste management in the coastal ecosystem so the presentation is oriented in a such a way that uh, see i will just give you an overview of the seagrass ecosystem of india how it is mapped in india what are the regulatory role of seagrass system and how it can be used as an indicator of ecosystem health and what is the economical value as we have done so uh, the source of the data whatever the uh, whatever the results we am presenting here is entirely researched by N ncsm unless and until it's stated otherwise and all this volume all this research has been published as a special volume for ocean and coastal work management uh, that is volume number 159 so uh, all of you are aware that co2 concentration has increased more than 400 parts per million and uh, day by day it's increasing so this um, glo global change uh, global climate change is known to everyone so no need to discuss it further but uh, at the same time when government of india is in its uh, in uh, indc is stating that we will uh, generate 3 to 5 billion ton of carbon Uh, through for uh, we will reduce the carbon footprint by forestation and 3 to 5 billion ton of uh, uh, carbon equal carbon will be forested and at the time we the coastal ecosystem which is very high sequestration capacity are uh, looked with very hope uh, for example the mangrove carbon sequestration capacity is well known because they have high biomass they store carbon for very long time very long period and at the same time the details of the seagrass is not studied in much detail one one of that it is very difficult to work in seagrass environment because mostly it's uh, under water and then you have to have a diver you have to have a special equipment and other things to carry out the research and then uh, to assess it's quite complicated so it has been not been studied but you can see that it just occupy 0.2% of the area of world ocean but it contribute more than 10% of the yearly organ carbon burial of the ocean so it's even though it's not uh, so much given emphasis in india but it's and it's still neglected but uh, it uh, it has a very significance in mitigating climate change so i will not go in detail because they uh, that uh, ng they are ng sperm and have a unique characteristics that they are uh, they are flowering plant if you happen to go to chilika or uh, or odisha in a holiday trip you ask your boatman to go take you to a area which is uh having sea grass you will be amazed to see the, that at a 2 uh, meter depth uh, very beautiful flowers all over the flo flowering and its water is crystal clear wherever in non sea grass area you will not be able to see the bottom but the uh, beauty is uh, uh, amazing so uh, it's a uh, found throughout the world along the coastline at 1 to 5 meter depth and the dark green area green area is the, uh, indicates the number of species which are located in india approximately 14 species has been reported so commonly uh, common species which are present in india are halophila um, hal and um, uh, various species of halophila halodule uh, cerimodium samodoisia uh, uh thalesia in halus and uh, they are uh, uh, in india colonizing as well as opportunistic as well as persistent persistent are they uh, the species which are present in each and every, uh, every type of environment irrespective of salinity they survive well whereas the colonizing and opportunistic if the salinity salinity changes or if there is a fresh water flow from the upstream their species concentration and health deteriorates so persistent uh, is mostly dominated in uh, park bay i will come to that shortly uh, 
uh, i will come to this slide shortly after some time but uh, uh, key features i will just give a glimpse that uh, seagrass meadows they are important nursery habitat already discussed yesterday on uh, how the fauna uh, uh, they host very a variety of fauna they act as a nutrient filter i will also come with the results that how they do and then uh, they are also used by the local community for as a, as a resource for uh, preparing mat and other floor products. Uh, they are uh, uh, they are food for turtles and other things, and then uh, they help uh, a variety of biodiversity. And their primary production is very high. So uh, this is just a conceptual diagram how they help in settling of the uh, suspended particular uh, particulate, and then help in the sedimentation, and then accordingly. Uh, these are some of the ecosystem services what they provide to the local environment or local ocean. They are habitat and nursery ground, and there are various factors they, that uh, uh, that influence their distribution, such as temperature, salinity, waves, current, depth, substrate, um, how long is the day, how much the sunlight is it's getting, and what is the external source of nutrient which is which is getting. Whether the, the if the sources of nutrient is very high, then there are chances of epiphytes are there. So if epiphytes are there, then it's, there is again a completion. So uh, and this is so there. Lot of things are there that I will go uh, come into detail uh, with the case study of um, uh, Park Bay. So, uh, this was an article our based uh, published in Times of India where we have summarized our result. The, uh, the Times of, uh, um, special correspondent from Times of India came and for an interview to uh, discuss uh, how, why, and uh, where the cigars are there, and how they are important for that. Why the government is so much emphasizing in their recent CRJ notification, and then so a detailed one page, uh, one full page article on cigars was published in Times of India uh, in 2019. So coming up with two uh, uh, services of uh, the cigar system. This, the seagrass system, as a, if a biomass is high, then the photosynthesis will be high, a uh, take of dissolving carbon will be high, and then the, there will be high oxygen pumping. So, uh, surrounding water will be highly rich with oxygen. So, and uh, subsequently, the carbon burial will be high, and then calcification will be high with if the uh, associated corals are there. Whereas, if in case of wet season, where the dominance of sal uh, salinity is not there, where the uh, low saline or freshwater input is there, or where there is increased nutrient input is there, the, there is a reduction, there will be competition with the other macroalgal um, uh, community, and then there will reduce water uptake and then there will be a significant redu a reduction in the carbon sequestration and oxygen pump of the system. So, and uh, coming to uh, India, uh, yeah, seagrass is mainly distributed in the Park Bay, Gulf of Manar, Chilka Lagoon, Ch uh, Lakshadweep, Andaman, Nikolai Island, and uh, Gulf of Kutch. Park Bay has the maximum area of uh, seagrass coverage, that is a 175 square kilometer, whereas the Chilka and Gulf of Manar come next. So Chilka is very, uh, Chil Chilka mostly is uh, dominated towards uh, Balugao, that is the southern sector. Luxury also has a quite good area of like, uh, uh, seagrass ecosystem. So uh, uh, that um, uh, here, how uh, different researchers have documented the area. Um, and uh, species, uh, how, what are the species? These are the key uh, research that has been published uh, where the Tangrajo and uh, J.R. Bhatt has uh, reviewed the status of seagrass cover and uh, till late in 2018. And then they have published uh, the whole checklist of the species and then community, how they, what are the factors that are uh, in influencing the area and other things. And they have uh, interestingly pointed out that uh, yeah, if we consider the over the uh, last uh, decades, uh, they, uh, none of the seagrass uh, has an increase. Uh, in all of the system, there has been a significant uh, changes or significant redu reduction in the area of the seagrass ecosystem. Uh, which is going up to 46% uh, of the 
uh, total area cover per se is loss in nicoba whereas the park bay which is uh, more or less sheltered environment is just the 9% so one of the reason that we, uh, when the fisherman goes for fishing uh, what happens that these are the leaf like long leaf like uh, structures which are floating in the uh, river bed so it gets entangled with the with the soft and that the propeller of the uh, mechanized uh, boat and what and as a result boat circuit so they think this as a wasteland they don't uh, consider uh, uh, this their carbon sequestration and oxygen uh, production or whether it's a habitat things that is important they for, since they is directly interfering in their movement and uh, uh, of uh, day to day movement to, for going for fishing they consider as a waste land and quite often due to their neg negligence also it is destroyed so that happens that uh, so uh, that happens that they take little uh, little effort in conservation like the way in case of mangroves community is quite aware for the conservation but in case of sigras the community awareness is very less so in uh, this uh, presentation i will be mostly focusing on chilika and park bay two uh, systems that how uh, uh, these are the two large ecosystems and then how it is uh, uh, important to study or give emphasis to sigras ecosystem system so park bay has a different uh, environment park bay is a completely open uh, with whereas a chilka is a closed lagoon and this mainly dominated with the uh, riverine input whereas park bay uh, as a, you know tamil nadu state is a dry state so rainfall is very less so mostly it's a high salinity is there uh, um, prevails throughout the year in park bay so coming to chilka chilka if in even have you visited it's one of the beautiful place in india to visit it's a very big lake uh, around 1000 square kilometer if you happen to cross uh, uh, go to calcutta from uh, calcutta from chennai or visakhapatnam you will uh, the train tracks crosses uh, 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 crosses by the chilika lagoon and it it's a very big lagoon northern part um, where it's a river dominance is mainly macrophytes whereas the red patches in this mangrove we can see the seagrass uh, distribution in india uh, in chilika so uh, uh, in this area the deforestation is there fresh water weed is there river catchment is very weak influences river visit water of uh, water flow is an issue and then seagrass uh, that is salinity is also an issue chilika some of the photographs i want to show you of chilika this is one of the picture where when do the, when we do the diurnal that is a day and night 24 hours sampling to see the how the uh, ecosystem behaves uh, with the tidal influx uh, at the time it's early one photograph this is one of the river where the, you can see the agriculture input or uh, that uh, non point source runoff is coming directly to the lagoon uh, this is a uh, within the uh, within the uh, chilika ecosystem the local community has put uh, aquaculture pond where the uh, shrimps are there so they use for low fisheries this is also a evening photograph of the fisherman uh, fishing in uh, chilika so uh, uh, this is geo satellite uh, gis uh, remote sensing map of seagrass ecosystem in the chilika lagoon and uh, it's a mainly it's a halophila and uh, uh, halophila and halodule is dominated then halophila is the dominant species and it's uh, to, uh, throughout the southern sector it's dominated so uh, uh, for the management practices the chilika development authority has divided into chilika into hypothetically four parts Uh, for the northern part central part uh, uh, southern part that is a uh, where high saline condition in silga is there and the four, uh, fourth part where the uh, mixing of uh, with the ocean is there so i will quite i will be quite offering uh, referring this uh, northern sector central sector southern sector and the outer channel these all as uh, like northern sector has a specific sal uh, very low salinity central sector is a intermixing zone where the uh, southern sector is a high salinity and uh, this is a zone of intermixing is the box four or that outer channel uh, so we carried out a throughout a very detailed studies in chilka with 36 samples and we at uh, most of the places we uh, did a diurnal that is day and night sampling where we stayed in a boat and then every hour we collected a sample and then uh, those were analyzed and then we also calculated how the sediment settling is there to see the 
carbon sequestration or carbon barrier. Park Bay has a unique environment. Everybody knows, about, I hope everybody knows about Ram Dhanus or Dhanush Koti, where they um, say, mythological, they say, uh, they say that uh, Sri Ram has built a, um, a bridge to uh, connect to um, uh, Sri Lanka. So, northern part, northern part is um, Park Bay and southern part is Gulf of Bay. Here, um, to uh, connect uh, Rameshram and Gulf of Bay, the very beautiful, picturesque beach, beach is there, uh, which is a Pamban Bridge. It's called as a, it's a where is northern part is the Park Bay and southern part is Gulf of Manar. And uh, this bridge or its thin line separates the both. Uh, Gulf of Manar has very beautiful or very uh, luxuriant growth of coral growth where uh, northern part or park bay has a mix uh, seagrass as well as the coral growth also but the seagrass is mainly dominated when uh, southern part is uh, protected by the government uh, legislation and uh, so here we collected uh, uh, line sampling or transit sampling and then we e-sampling we have done the transit study and then we mapped the seagrass and then health also we have put accordingly now come we will come to just uh, quickly i will just show we uh, i will just go, uh, go to this slide just see you see wherever the seagrass that is the southern portion wherever the southern portion is there seagrass there the nutrient deficiency despite of that uh, see uh, nutrients coming from the northern part uh, that rivers or other things the seagrass takes up the nutrient and then it helps to maintain the balance of the nutrient by uptaking or, uh, or removing the nutrient. Whereas the northern part where there is no seagrass ecosystem uh, due to nutrient enrichment, a huge dense belt of uh, macrophyte has grown where it's not able to, we cannot navigate. It's so dense, we cannot navigate through the area. So similarly, we see in the case of DIP also, DIP also in the way the Pass, uh, is there the seagrass takes up the nitrogen and phosphorus same was observed in case of uh, park bay also that seagrass uh, helps in uh, removing the nutrient from the surrounding water so they condition the water they helps in fighting the eutrophication and they uh, so are they uh, and if they uh, uh, they act as a safeguard to our uh, biological barrier uh, to eutrophication and thus helping and uh, stabilizing the aquatic community so coming to uh, their productivity they are highly productive um, from the respiration you can see that uh, even the negative respiration that uh, uh, they produce oxygen so much that uh, even the respiration rates uh, overall net respiration rate goes to negative gross pro water column pro pro water column net water column productivity is always higher than the water column respiration so seagrass um, protect productivity is much 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 higher than the uh, net uh, water column productivity uh, net water column productivity means phytoplankton productivity it's the overall productivity of the area, uh, uh, area which uh, also indicates microbial productivity algal, uh, algal uh, respiration and everything but uh, overall whenever the seagrass is there it dominates everything and then they pump ox uh, pump oxygen to the uh, surrounding water we uh, we uh, just try to put the oxygen utilizer uh, wherever the seagrass is there you see a negative util oxygen uh, utilization that is the, the aquatic community which is there which is not taking up the oxygen the uh, negative means not taking up the oxygen oxygen uh, the area is surplus with the oxygen if the oxygen is more in the water definitely it will be good for the aquatic uh, life and uh, things where is another part that um, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, that uh, will just say uh, where is where there is a high algal growth has been observed there the we observe that oxygen utilization is uh, very high that is up to 62 that because there is a high dense algal mat we'll just uh, we'll just i will just explain you a uh, little down uh, this already i told, uh, told that uh, they act as a very high uh, oxygen pump as a for in the area if uh, simodacea has the maximum uh, uh, water column associated with simodacea has the highest do saturation whereas uh, with when the seagrass is degraded the do saturation also degrees and the water column which does not have any seagrass or which is devoid of any vegetation has a very low um, uh, do saturation 
and uh, it is uh, interesting to observe that uh, bio saturation in pco2 that respiration will say uh, uh, that this uh, they never usually we think that peak is the sunlight peak is at one o'clock and then there is a uh, sun starts to um, uh, set and then uh, there is a uh, reduction in this thing but uh, uh, at maximum uh, ex uh, uh, we uh, never we have the um, uh, maxima in the productivity or maxima in co2 respiration at the peak uh, sunlight level always there was a lag of two to three years that was a uh, due to the enzymic activity and the, the two hours there was a lag was observed so this uh, we discussed net ecosystem metabolism if we say there is always it was negative with the uh, seagrass ecosystem that means that uh, it uh, supported autotrophy uh, that uh, system was autotrophic autotrophic means that system was able to consume uh, or make uh, the food uh, for uh, for themselves it doesn't really, uh, need an external source of the heterotrophy uh, heterotrophy wherever the seagrass dominance are there other um, uh, that um, other factors like um, fresh water input or other factors where they uh, they are the heterotrophy dominated and it was quite interesting to observe that uh, seagrass uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, index called argonite saturation and calcite saturation that based on from the cover uh, from ph and then uh, ph that that is a um, uh, uh, from acidity uh, by bicarbonate and carbonate concentration and that salinity and do we calculate argonite saturation and calcite saturation and wherever the seagrass was there that it was clearly observed that it helped in the calcification of the organism and the cal calcification was as much as 18 percent higher than the other places where the seagrass are they are definitely uh, from the community productivity of phytoplankton and community productivity of seagrass, we also can conclude they are the highly carbon, they have a high rate of carbon because more productivity will be there, more it will take, and more biomass will be formed, and more biomass will be formed, more biomass will go to the sediment, it will decay and go to the sediment and will be buried for. Uh, millennia, millennia of the year. Whereas in the case of when the community productivity is less, that biomass will also be less, and then sequestration rate will be high. Uh, coming, we also compared the different uh, seagrass ecosystems of India, and uh, species-wise, Semodesia has the highest uh, below root, below ground biomass versus uh, uh, above ground biomass ratio. This ratio is very important that it, because it's the mainly the below ground biomass that contributes to this carbon sequestration, uh, whereas the upper above ground mass it's uh, subject to grazing or whether it's subject to destruction that well below ground mass there is a real bio biomass in case of uh, see it goes and it, uh, it stores the carbon for uh, it's very persistence or very resistance to decay and we also calculated the uh, sediment career, uh, burial rates and then see that how it's a, it's a, that uh, from uh, uh, we saw that it's a mainly it's at the 30 centimeter that upper 30 centimeter where the, all the activity microwave activity is there that is a active zone and then slowly the carbon gets buried and then uh, it's and from all this our result we tried to devise a budget for uh, that what will be there how much respiration will there there so in chilika we came out around uh, 0.002 uh, teragram teragram is that around 2 megagram uh, 2 gigagram of carbon it is a uh, biomass is there similarly below ground biomass also we calculated barrier rate we calculated sediment uh, how much uh, sediment carbon is storing that also calculated for 80 5 square uh, meter uh, water water column how much carbon it's calculating and what is the respiration rate and what is the barrier rate uh, that uh, so net fluxes and uh, we call as fluxes and uh, that uh, sinks sinks uh, we calculated for chilika similarly for park bay as you see the uh, rates are quite high more approximately eight to ten times higher than park bay uh, that mainly due to this um, high salinity and better uh, less stressor as compared to Chilika. And uh, uh, based on that, we estimated for um, uh, the Indian coastline and then say that um, uh, biomass will uh, approximately one megagram of carbon, um, organic carbon per hectare the above ground biomass stores in India. 
and the burial it uh, uh, it buries around 1.7 megagram per hectare per year whereas the uh, se sediment is uh, uh, sediment uh, storage is approximately 150 megagram uh, organic carbon per year so overall we have estimated that one meter that is a uh, seagrass ecosystem uh, if it is preserved uh, it is preserved and protected um, then uh, it also it will also contribute that india's uh, ndc where the it's mainly we are focusing on that terrestrial and mangrove forest but uh, seagrass uh, the contribution has of seagrass ecosystem has not been listed by any of the agency yet uh, uh, we have still a long way to go but their contribution is really really very high uh, so if we consider the if we uh, if we uh, uh, compare with the global productivity pro productivity i am talking because productivity can be directly correlated with the uh, carbon uh, uptake and the carbon burial so uh, it compares the productivity of seagrass uh, uh, ecosystem of park bay compares with the uh, other system that is it can be comparable even the some of the ecosystem is very high productivity and like in uh, united states or in um, uh, um, that um, uh, you know, North Sea or whether it's Japan. So, but uh, uh, still, uh, the Park Bay compares well. Chilika, yes, Chilika has lots of stresses, so there is an issue. Uh, but nevertheless, the system itself is a very beautiful and it's maintaining its ecological balance very nicely. So, we need not to worry. Um, so already I discussed uh, these things and now how we can take them as an indicator of ecosystem health. So uh, there is a, like the students, uh, we prepare a report card at the end of the days. So for ecosystem also, we have a report card approach. We call it as ecosystem health report card. Uh, ecosystem health, if you Google uh, Chilka ecosystem health report card, you will get very beautiful report card where we have graded. I will uh, show you in a couple of slides later that how we have graded, uh, where we have uh, graded the water quality with the respect of their, how it is the health, how it is preferred for that. If more than 80% is there, then the water quality is excellent. It's preferred for the habitat condition and the good, wa good water is B, category B. So, and F is less than 20%, where you need to have inter, uh, immediate immediate uh, policy legislative action whereas 20 uh, 20 percent to 40 percent also uh, for 60 uh, so c is very uh, crucial zone because as most of the indian ecosystems uh, falls within the c or b c is a very uh, um, uh, vulnerable zone where a slight uh, change in the policy or slight uh, neglig negligence can shift you to either d or it can uh, slight uh, effort can move you to b um, uh, d is uh, again poor water quality leading to a degraded habitat c uh, we never uh, watch for f f uh, we have never found, we have not found it in any place in india but they still uh, this these are the and in this water quality index another index is also included that is a sea life index it is a sea life index is uh, made of a four component that uh, predators herbivores uh, fleshy microalgae and hard corals uh, you know, based on their conditions very good good fair poor and critical this sea life, sea life index is uh, derived and based on this water quality index and the sea life index we derive to a health report card which gives an indication uh, that uh, to a layman, to a common man, policy maker, politician, or uh, uh, anyone who does not have any background in science, yes, your son has performed well. Um, no, I, uh, his grade is B. So he needs more effort, more pumping of money. Yeah, your son has performed A. You have to keep in A, then you have to maintain the status in. Yes, he's performed. So it's a, for the policy maker that who needs to just have an indication that whether we have to, what type of uh, things we have to do, whether we need to maintain the status quo or an intervention. So in this, uh, for water quality index, there are various uh, key parameter that is taken. That is a DO, turbidity, chlorophyll, temperature, nitrate, phosphate, and pH. 
so and uh, uh, all together fisheries water quality and biodiversity uh, aquatic health uh, bio uh, uh, aquatic uh, that faunal health floral health and water quality all together makes the health index which health, uh, the health index is plotted and the plotted is result in the form of a, a report card uh, here in park bay like i uh, i wish to show that um, uh, coral health index and sea life index sea life index is uh, you can see that most of places it's a good but coral health is in rex is very bad because uh, coral health uh, park bay does not come uh, the corals of park bay are not protected um, they uh, that is strict conservation measure that is uh, like gulf of manar is biosphere uh, reserve and marine life park uh, it is a uh, protected under the legislative legislation by whereas the park bay um, uh, local uh, they go for fishing they aqua um, capafagus uh, that is a seaweed farming is also there other type of activities are there tourist comes and there is no restriction and other things so the we found that coral uh, health index is at the alarming level uh, coming to uh, uh, this uh, around uh, uh, coral health index and sea life index around uh, rameshwaram uh, pamban to agni tirtham also it was the same and the sea life uh, index uh, when, wherever the sea grass uh, presence was there there the carbon uh, calcium carbonate uh, saturation was increased and at that at those places we had a better sea life index as well as the coral life index so uh, uh, this uh, this is a seagrass cover as well as a sea life index there was a direct indication that uh, if we increase or we preserve the seagrass cover definitely the health and the um, uh, extent of corals or uh, both will increase because they act as a buffer in uh, uh, any external pressures so um, coming to the overall report card if you see in the water quality index the overall um, is mostly green that uh, some places is a sea but uh, it's mostly uh, uh, if you remember the circles that we uh, saw with respect to different different component uh, is a uh, green blue and yellow ph do and all those things this colors corresponds to that uh, and um, uh, accordingly i'll just uh, overall it will i will show overall uh, uh, this uh, like um, uh, devi patnam and mandapan area uh, the coral um, the water quality index was a plus because seagrass health was also quite good um, uh, a we in the case of olaikuda coral um, water quality was good so overall it was a Uh, but you should remember that uh, sea life index was, or coral life index was bad so uh, it has to be seen as a holistic way and uh, the chilika similarly we saw north uh, northern sector since this was highly microfluidic and high fresh water nutrient discharge other things were there so we found it as a minus b minus b minus that uh, is, uh, interventions are immediately required um central zones where it was a uh, mix between the sea, uh, southern and uh, northern sector so um some sea grass ecosystems are also there so here it is a b plus good water quality uh southern zone uh, uh, b again because uh, uh, sea, uh, sea grass ecosystem are they we are there but at the same time that uh, place one side is a uh, it's a highly one of the densely populated area so nutrient discharge also was quite high so overall we see health uh, chilika health of the chilika we can grade it to b uh, b means uh, pumping or uh, money uh, pumping of uh, interventions and other things are required uh, so water quality is good and so continuous monitoring is essential to recover for the recovery and of um, seagrass and coral systems uh coming to now coming to the uh, these are all about the good uh, thing about the seagrass but we at the same time as i discussed we face a lot of stress uh, the one is the one i already uh, spoke that it is a negligence of the local community that they treat this uh, seagrass as a wasteland that uh, does not help them like man mango wave is well was the community also or ngo local uh, uh, um, uh, local uh, village self help group or other thing they everybody know honey and all those thing timber uh, and other ecosystem services the same grass the it has not been publicized or popularized as it should have been 
but uh, nevertheless the condition is improving but uh, the uh, we see the uh, mean uh, or uh, you see the enemy enemy is uh, of seagrass mainly is the turtle it can eat uh, two gram kg of one turtle can eat two kg of seagrass leaf in a day uh, in uh, islands of luxury turtle grazing is a key factor which uh, seagrass uh, uh, which uh, give, uh, which is stressor to seagrass but nevertheless it's a natural phenomena so the graze and then again seagrass again grows so uh, that we do not suggest any interventions so uh, in addition to that other threats are that sea level change rise and fall if the rise and fall is there water column will change water column will change accordingly sunlight penetration turbidity salinity everything will change if cyclone and storm surge are there that also uh, causes damage climate cycle drought and flood also causes uh, changes to the ecosystem uh, functioning of the seagrass uh, physical removal motorboat disturbance dredging shoreline development uh, water quality all this influences uh, uh, seagrass ecosystem um, uh, this uh, already discussed and then uh, uh, here you see that uh, this is a at extreme co uh, corner this is an example of beach nourishment. Beach nourishment that uh, one side it may be a port and uh, there is a breakwater growing. So uh, that has re uh, resulted in the longshore drift or longshore current uh, restriction, longshore current as a result that whatever the sediment movement was there along the coast that is restricted. And as a result, one side of the port um, that uh, um, you know, accretion has started and another side it has started eroding. So what they do, uh, they pump from sand from one side to another uh, to have the bay uh, to give us continuous supply of sand to the area. So there is a, to arrest the beach erosion. But at the same time, it increases the turbidity to the surrounding water and it's a very um, uh, harmful for seagrass. So uh, other water quality, how it influences aquaculture and fisheries influences salinity changes, weed, tourism, agriculture, seabed, uh, trawlers, epiphyte. Epiphyte are the more, uh, one of the uh, biggest stre stress causing regions to uh, um, uh, um, uh, seagrass health. And then uh, this already discussed. Uh, and uh, till uh, uh, till now, seven, uh, uh, throughout the world, seventy-two species of seagrass were known. Out of that, these due to human activity, seven are at the uh, risk of extinction, and three are endangered. So yeah, now this is a very interesting phenomena which is observed in the seagrass system. system. Uh, we consider as a if you think that seagrass is a continuum that uh, land. Then, and then there is a water, water they, where the sources of uh, runoff is coming uh, from the surrounding uh, land to the um, coast. And then coast, there is a, some gap and then there is a seagrass bed and then there is a open ocean. So it's a land ocean continuum. Now what happens when the when the nutrient come, when the nutrients are optimal or nutrient limits, seagrass will grow. But seagrass will grow. But uh, since the seagrass growth is slow as compared to algal growth or uh, there will be soon if the nutrient uh, if uh, nutrient keep on continu uh, continuously uh, coming or nutrient enrichment is there, then the growth of epiphyte and microalgae will be because they are fast growing and phytoelectron will grow. And slowly they will cover the seagrass leaves and then their growth will be there. So in case uh, where the excessive nutrients are coming. So then uh, 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 due to this uh, dense uh, algal mat or things, there will be a limitation to light uh, to the cigarette system. And as a result, that will interfere with the productivity. And consequently, death and decay of the cigarette system will be interfered. This was especially observed in the northern part of the Park Bay. Uh, it's a place called Katumawadi where the um, agriculture and other activity, uh, aquaculture activities were high. Uh, at that places, uh, even during uh, low tide zone, we can see this black, uh, thick black uh, dense sense of seagrass which has been washed away. And then uh, you can see in the picture which we have taken underwater that seagrass beds are covered with a thick algal bed. Uh, this is Salmodesia and then the uh, same the algal bed is observed. Uh, more species and then uh, how the epiphytes and this uh, leaves are covered. Uh, this is a floating algal bed. Again, uh, uh, 
so we took a leaf and then we uh, uh, we identified the what are the things are they what are the type of species are there on the leaf and then we found the anthozoa the hydrozoa the corallinophilus the polychaetes are the hydrozoa are the bryozoa are the so these all uh, harbor on the leaves and then uh, subsequently they will interfere with the uh, photosynthetic ability of the leaf so uh, this uh, results in the seagrass degradation because the uh, microalgae uh, uh, proliferates and this uh, you can see how much seagrass uh, is being washed away due to death and slow decay and uh, uh, this we if we present in the um, uh, graphical form with uh, increasing nutrient at uh, when the uh, uh, there will be an optimal level where the seagrass will be dominate and the micro algae uh, will not be and then uh, at the time there will be there that seagrass will uh, uh, decline and the, it will be entirely taken up with the micro algae uh, so uh, and this has result in uh, this can result in a uh, decrease in uh, carbon sequestration from 6 to teragram per year globally this is research published by Farquhar so 6 to 24 gram teragram carbon per year due to microphyte uh, uh, so we uh, we took um, uh, plots uh, underwater that one is uh, these are uh, 50 square meter 50 meter 50 centimeter into 50 centimeter quadrants that we took and then we collected samples representative and then we counted the seagrass healthy seagrass degraded seagrass seagrass with epiphytes and then representative samples we took and then we analyze in uh, different scenario and then we uh, uh, we uh, micro photograph that uh, what are the epiphytes there and uh, and then we uh, also uh, did uh, some decomposition rate experiment that if the seagrass these seagrass are washed away on the shore so again that uh, when uh, when uh, something you are taking out of the system system then that their degradation rate will change completely completely because there will be a different set of bacteria uh, in land there will be a different sector of bacteria which will be acting on the organic matter degradation and then it will there will be a fast release of carbon nitrogen and phosphorus in the decay species and then it uh, again it will um, uh, release back those nutrients to the water and then once the it is there unless until we check the source of nutrient this is cyclic process that where one uh, so one activity will trigger and another and uh, that tr uh, trigger activity will uh, second activity will, will trigger third and third will again come back and trigger one and then it will go on unless until you take uh, one the one ball out it will go on continuously and then the system will be doing it. so we took the seagrass and then with uh, uh, we carried out different experiments in the lab where we check the presence of uh, uh, micro um, uh, bacteria in, in absence of bacteria, how the seagrass degradation was ob observed. And then overall, we from the results, we can just say that the microbial inhibited state that a uh, higher concentration of DOC. And overall, it we say that if the total uh, seagrass litter available along the uh, park there, uh, that we uh, estimated based on the remote sensing and other um, uh, some places we weighed and then accordingly length of whatever there is there uh, we measured and then it is approximately 30 megagram of the other so it will uh, it is an additional source of uh, uh, one megagram of nitrogen and 0.3 megagram of phosphorus to the environment and again you, uh, you can think of that uh, this uh, uh, will entirely uh, result to in we call it as a microalgal shift so microalgal shift this is a conceptual diagram that we have drawn that is uh, completely uh, where the one community will be uh, uh, taken by slowly by the uh, another community so uh, like john d is a healthy john d is a healthy seagrass bed in the extreme right you can see and then um, uh, john c is partially macroalgal john b is uh, uh, highly algal and this john is the dead seagrass uh, bed so slowly uh, john d to john a it will come and then again, they will uh, it will be source of nutrient, and then these nutrient will be again uh, uh, influencing the other zone. And this um, uh, from uh, remote sensing also, we just uh, tried to put across. This was work done by Dr. Jijo. Yeah, so um, in NCSM, so th uh, this is a. Uh, 
um, seagrass if you ever cover and uh, we can see that in katamari how the microalgal shift is occurring how the uh, how uh, the algal cover is taking over the seagrass cover so to summarize uh, it has been a long presentation but to summarize that uh, we concluded that uh, they were high productive and uh, they have this was the first type of extensive study where we have taken the each and every component of the seagrass ecosystem and then we uh, try to put that to uh, develop the knowledge product for the seagrass which are quite often neglected and then we also uh, try to see that whether the any greenhouse gas emissions was there but i have not presented these things and then uh, uh, this again ipcc has indicated how their annual global loss is there and then based on all this result uh, we calculated the ecosystem services that we try to monetize that whether the, um, how this um, ecosystem services whether carbon sequestration and rate or storage as biomass or solar uh, carbon or um, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, area uh, how much econ economic value it can put per year so um, it's uh, in term of mil million that uh, seagrass of chilika is uh, approximately 2.3 2.4 million 2.4 million us dollar whereas seagrass of park bay is 1.3 to uh, 2.2 million us dollar so uh, we need a blueprint for a blue carbon that protect the shoreline because it's they diminish the waste energy provide important nursery for fish uh, shellfish and crustacea regulate uh, cycling on nutrient and sequestration carbon sequestration they are very crucial component for our eco, uh, ecosystem funds me so um, uh, again we try to put in a, for kids and layman's language we try to that how much it will be that we uh, based on our results we that one acre of seagrass will mitigate co2 emission for a, an automobile or a car which is traveling around 6000 km that uh, 6000 km if you travel that uh, much uh, uh, one acre of seagrass can uh, secure, uh, mitigate carbon in any year it uh, can sequester 3350 carbon per year and it absorbs 2 kg of nutrients that is uh, equivalent to the treated effluent from 490 uh, people uh, uh, around 500 people uh, persons uh, sewage uh, that is equivalent to it provides an eco net ecosystem services there we discuss only uh, that uh, car uh, that uh, uh, carbon burial services but it net ecosystem services like provisioning climatic and other things uh, both uh, approximately 11 crore uh, rupees per year so are they protected yes they are protected national policy on marine, uh, marine fisheries specifically says that uh, to uh, um, guideline for fisher community that uh, not to disturb or protect uh, that um, uh, disturb or uh, degrade or damage seagrass a bit uh, while fishing wildlife protection act also says so uh, they are in the epa act uh, 1986 and biodiversity act in 2002 and they are very much emphasized for the protection status as a crz one area in crz notification one as well as crz notification 2019 so uh, if we say the protection of the habitat yes the protection of habitat is mainly uh, covered in the wildlife protection act in water protection act the biodiversity act. and the addressing the threats of the seagrass uh, uh, fisheries fisheries uh, M uh, mrf mfra act and then coastal area erosion act water protection act environment protection act and qcr uh, coastal aquaculture authority of uh, act uh, then in uh, uh, coastal construction also is back uh, uh, mandated under the ei notification where we have to take consider and then uh, people's participation for that is uh, 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 already mentioned in the crj notification as a cvc a cvc is a um, that um, coastal vulnerability um, uh, 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 critically vulnerable, vulnerable coastal area. Um, so where the community participate, community is involved for the management of the ecosystem. Uh, so the NCSM also is doing the real time monitoring of the um, uh, coast, uh, this uh, seagrass system, seagrass uh, intermixing of sea, uh, where seagrass and coral ecosystem are in tandem. The both the places we have put our data boy and. Uh, weather stations where uh, like um, uh, Park Gulf of Manar, uh, Kavarati Island in Lakshadweep, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Marine National Park in uh, Wandu, uh, Andaman Island, Gulf of Kutch, Gujarat, 
and now i would like to thank you for your patience listening i think it was a quite long uh, uh, thank you if any questions are there i will be happy to take them Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gurmeet. It was indeed a pleasure to hear from you on sea grasses conservation and management of uh, sea grass ecosystem in India. Uh, actually, it was an insightful and enlightening talk on significance of sea grasses and the comparative analysis of two major sea grass ecosystem made it easier to understand. Uh, it has actually broadened our knowledge on sea grasses for for sure now. Uh, with your due permission, sir, I would now like to take up a few questions from our audience. So, uh, first question is from a very inquisitive student of a Deshpandu College. He's asking, sir, many developed countries are working on blue carbon projects in salt marshes and sea grass systems. How can we incorporate such ambitious projects in India too? Uh, yeah, uh, in India there are several projects. Uh, Government of India has taken up over the past decade or that uh, um, uh, even more. That uh, since last twenty years there has been significant research in the blue carbon ecosystems in, in India. Mangrove has been widely studied throughout India. There is no uh, not a single mangrove area which has been left. Seagrass also has caught attention in last uh, last decade, and then there are several studies, and uh, it is finding its place. It is finding place in government policies, uh, research. People are coming, even the students are coming up and then taking the CRS. So it it will not be a, uh, justified to say that in India we are lagging behind. But yes, there are a lot more to uh, do. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is uh, from uh, the same student. How do we process an organic fertilizer? made out of seagrass such that it will have a long shelf life no organic uh, 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 till now i don't know any uh, any uh, at any place that organic fertilizers are made out of seagrass okay uh, first of all their harvest is strictly restricted you cannot do the harvest if you can't do the harvest then they there is no question of organic fertilizer even the whatever the residues are there that also is managed and dumped properly uh, the state forest department is taking and then they are, they are not promoting or they are not saying the, anyone that uh, it should be converted into once you start that uh, talking yes this is this is organic matter which is degraded and you can convert into fertilizer then people will go and start uh, they it will give a con continuously uh, it will give a new dimension that for the sake of fertilizer they will start harvest, harvesting and that but still the organic fertilizer for organic fertilizer why we want to take the seagrass there is a, a compost is there compost we are not able to utilize we, farmers are not taking up compost they go for an organic fertilizer first we try to uh, um, uh, that uh, away, make them aware about that thank you uh, dr gurmeet uh the third question is from Devidas Kapadnes. Uh, my apologies if I'm not pronouncing the name clearly. Uh, he's asking, what are the hottest issues of seagrass that should be addressed and discussed? And I think I have, uh, in case of that, uh, where I, in the last section, I already discussed where yeah. there is, uh, what are the factors we, which are influencing the seagrass degradation. I think you, I, uh, you have got your answer there, right? If you need further clarification, my email is shared. So you can always contact me. I will be very happy to give you a recent detail or I will be able to share the, all this, whatever the presentation I've made that all uh, well documented in scientific literature and these uh, uh, publications are available. I will be very happy to share with you. You can contact me anytime. Thank you so much, sir. Next question is from uh, Devidas, sir, only. He's asking, what is the short, medium and long-term impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on ocean sustainability, what would be their alleviators and excarburetors? Now, till now, they I think don't think that there has been any study. Yes, 
uh yes uh, in, in in term of india uh, in indian context but yes uh, you, you, you from a perception point of view there is a uh, industries and other things where definitely there is a due to covid uh, restriction on the activity and uh, human activity and other things uh, yeah, ecosystem uh, health of ecosystems had, have improved everywhere not only in case of seagrass but throughout the world these things has been observed but still i don't think that there has been any study in this context uh, in coastal ecosystem system conducts uh, it has been there has been here and there there has been study that they said that a do level has increased and bod has improved uh, uh, water quality has improved but uh, to see a long term uh, uh, effect is too early to say thank you sir uh, next question is how might massive arrivals of sargassum impact mangrove ecosystems pardon sir uh, uh, how might massive arrival of sargassum impact mangrove ecosystems uh, no no how arrival of sargassum yeah uh, just uh, yeah uh, actually uh, this is a very uh, uh, interesting question sargassum uh, uh, he mean to say that seaweed seaweeds uh, uh, they act in tandem um, the, that uh, central marine fishery um, uh, cmfri central marine fishery research of uh, research institute of india and sdmri nasa institute of ocean technology and uh, nccr nccm these are the couple of institute which has been working on this uh, seaweed cultivation in the park bay park bay is one of the uh, key area where the uh, sea cultiv uh, seaweed cultivation that is sargassum cultivation is there yeah in sea in case of seagrass it has not been any documented uh, any um, uh, impact on that but uh, in case of coral yes it has been considered a threat to the coral ecosystem and there has been several studies uh, where uh, the sargassum cultivation should be take uh, should be uh, the which area sargassum cultivation uh, should be considered which area should not be there has been a detailed guideline also you can check with the cmfri or sdmri side there you will get the detail okay thank you sir uh, next question is from one of our speaker uh, uh, dr rupesh bhumia he is asking how was sea grass productivity calculated and whether this was done on diurnal and seasonal basis can you please shed some light on methodology and equipment needed for such studies uh equipment in case of equipment you uh, first i will talk about the methodology uh in case of uh, when we measure the productivity we first uh, there is a method for measurement of do do it's a light a light bottle and dark bottle method it's a very common method, method which is used in the ecology do. when you go um, uh, when you go to a field you um, they fix the do uh, initial the do you fix and then uh, at the regular time interval you fix the do and then uh, how the do changes over the period of time that continuously for a two, one a full tide cycle that is a uh, one high tide low tide high tide low tide to uh, for till 20, uh, total 26 hours you do the continuous measurement and from that you arrive at that how the do changes and based on that uh, do and dic and other nutrient value you arrive at the productivity how the productivity is there uh, you can refer to the uh, publication uh, in mbio if you want you can contact me i can share you the publication how the methods are there and how we can measure it it's a very simple it's a no big instrument only you need a uh, you need a pipette a couple of chemicals and then uh, uh, one do bottle uh, one uh, black cover and then you can measure that uh, productivity easily it's not a big uh, thank you dr gurmeet uh, it's indeed uh, a pleasure to hear from you once again and like uh, we would like to thank you for satisfactorily answering all of the queries so patiently we are grateful to you uh, i would now yeah. request uh, our tic uh, our teacher in charge yes sir ma'am i i would like to take one more question uh, dr sahdev has asked uh, why seagrass distribution not occurred between chilika and park bay he just uh, put in a question right now uh, but mangrove exist 
Sahadev Sarma. He has put a question that why seagrass distribution is not occurring between Chilika and Park Bay, but mangrove exists. Yes, uh, I would, uh, Sahadev, I would like to answer that uh, seagrass distribution dist uh, depends on the law, lot of things, in which the river discharge is also an important criteria. Uh, all along the coast, there are in all along the east coast, there are a lot of big rivers which are coming and draining their water. So, where the sed uh, siltation is high or sedimentation is high, uh, sediment uh, uh, turbidity is high the seagrass growth will, will will not be favored they want a sheltered environment that's why they grow in the southern zone of the uh, chilika as well as in the park bay where they need a sheltered environment to settle and grow okay thank you sir i would now request a teacher in charge dr aparna notial department of botany university of delhi deshpandu college India to formally conclude the session by delivering the vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, dear Neha. So, uh, greetings to everyone. A very good evening. Namaste from India and Salamat Futang from Malaysia to all of you. So, here we come to an end of the three day international webinar series. Jointly organized by Department of Botany, Deshbandu College, University of Delhi, India, and Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Sir, uh, uh, Dr. Gurmeet, uh, sir, can you please uh, uh, stop sharing the screen? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you, sir. Ends are not the bad things. They just mean that something else is about to begin. So hoping for a new beginning ahead, today I'm here to express my sincere gratitude by extending a vote of thanks to all those who need special recognition and played a major role in successful execution of this webinar. This three-day international webinar series was materialized in collaboration to create a better understanding and awareness amongst our students, research scholars, and faculty about the coastal ecosystems and their conservation, restoration, and sustainable use for a better future. We are delighted to share that participants from different parts of the world like Malaysia, Indonesia, Yemen, New Zealand, Cambodia, and Bangladesh joined for this webinar. From India itself, we get good number of participations from all over the states. From UP, Madhya Pradesh, JNK, Telangana, Jharkhand, Bihar, Haryana, Maharashtra, West Bengal, Manipur, Gujarat, Nagaland, Kerala, Karnataka, Punjab, other than Delhi and NCR. So we got lot number representation from each of the state from India. We are very much grateful to all of our speakers who spared their valuable time and delivered mesmerizing and captivating talks about aquatic flora in coastal areas. Our list of speakers included Dr. Gillian Uili Sim and Dr. Rupesh Bhumia for day one. Dr. Sahdev Sharma and Dr. Krishna Ray for day two. And Dr. Nebul Islam Khan and Dr. Gurmeet Singh for today's session. We are really thankful to all of you for gracefully accepting our invitation and giving your consent on a short notice. We are very much fortunate to have a positive and driving force of encouragement as our head of the institution who always motivates us to explore new ideas and to turn them to a reality. We are very much thankful to our own and our one and only dynamic respected principal Professor Rajiv Agarwal for all his support and encouragement for organizing this webinar. Thanks are also due to our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Aditya Saxena and DBT Star College coordinator, Dr. Indrikan Singh for all the support and guidance they provided us. We are thankful to our funding agency, Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India for all the financial support that we get for all of our projects being undertaken in the college. We are very much honored and privileged to collaborate with our co-host institute, Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia, by the wholehearted support of Professor Sunyani Yusuf, Director, Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia. For this, we are really obliged to you, ma'am, and we wish that our association continues in future too for such collaborative projects. Well, the idea of international webinar was the brainchild of our most humble and multi-talented convener, Dr. Madhurani, who approached Dr. Sahdev 
from Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, University of Malaya, Malaysia for materializing it within no time. It was the combined initiative and all sincere efforts of both our conveners, Dr. Madhurani and Dr. Sahdev Sharma, with all of our organizing team members from both the host institutes that this webinar was accomplished. So a big round of applause for both the teams. Famous quote by Sitaro says, individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. So by this mutualistic association, we have gathered to become a vast ocean of sharing knowledge, wisdom, and diversity from different parts of the world. I would fail in my duties if I don't mention the names and efforts that were put by organizing team of IOES, University of Malaya, Malaysia, who played an important role in conduction of this webinar. We have with us Dr. Mohammad Rijman bin Idi, who was coordinator of Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences from University of Malaya, Malaysia, Dr. Sahdev Sharma, convener of the program, Dr. Chie V, co-convener of the program, and Dr. Kishnet Palanivelu, who was again co-convener of this program. Sincere thanks to all of you for your efficient coordination and execution. The strength of the team is each individual member and the strength of each member is the team, says a famous quote by Phil Jackson. So let me introduce to you our dynamic team of botany department, Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi, India, where each member of the team has supported and guided wholeheartedly for this webinar. To start with, we have the senior most colleagues and backbone of our department, Dr. Sarla Gupta, Dr. Bela Bhatia, Dr. Roshni Rajamohan Mathur, Dr. Dharmendra Kumar Malik, Dr. Rajinder Kumar, Dr. Kumar Shantanu, Dr. Anju Chibbar, Dr. Madhurani, who is convener of the program, Dr. Sunita Malik, Ms. Anjana Singh, Dr. Saurav Singh Dev, Dr. Rubina Chongthem, Dr. Neha Yadav, and Dr. Preeti Rawat. Both Rubina and Dr. Preeti Rawat were co-conveners of the program. Heartfelt thanks are also due to our technical leader from Department of Computer Sciences, Dr. Monica Bajaj, without whose support it would not have been possible to conduct this online webinar so smoothly and, un uh, and uninterrupted. My heart goes out to thanks uh, to thank our all participants from different colleges, departments, and institutes from different countries for accepting our invitation, participating, and attending the webinar with enthusiasm. To name a few, some of, uh, some of them are uh, senior colleagues of our own department and some of, uh, some of them are my own teachers from the Department of Botany, University of Delhi. Without your kind presence, we could not have accomplished what we had dreamt for. Furthermore, let's have a special recognition and big cheers for all of our student volunteers who work day and night to give their best for the successful organization of the webinar. Their diligent work behind the curtains is the driving force. A big round of applause for all of our students. I also express my gratitude to our non-teaching staff for helping in many ways. I sincerely apologize if I missed out someone's name. We really enjoyed working in collaboration with the organizing team from University of Malaya, Malaysia. Now it's time to say goodbye. Goodbyes are not forever. Goodbyes are not the end. They simply mean we will miss you until we meet again. So hoping to see you all again in near future for some other activity. I take your leave as tomorrow we will be celebrating the festival of colors, Holi. So I wish a happy, safe and colorful Holi to all of you from India. Namaste to all of you from India and Salam Jahan to all our team of Malaysia. We loved working with you. So thank you so much to all our team from Malaysia. Thank you. Dhanyavad. Happy Holi to all of you. I would request all of you to switch on your camera for just two minutes so that we can uh, take a photograph and uh, we can keep it for cherishing our memories. And also feedback link is also being given at the end. So please fill it so that you can get the e-certificate at the end. Uh, e-certificate is generated. So may I request all of you to please switch on your camera so that we can have a group, group photograph of all of us.
Devida sir is raising his hand. So I think he wants to say something. Can uh, Madhu, can we unmute him? Yes, I'm trying. He, want, he wants to say something, I think. Uh, I'm asking you, sir, to unmute, to kindly unmute yourself. Devidas ji, you are unmuted. So if you want to say something, you can say. Thank you, madam. Uh, just a short uh, announcement for all the participants that we will be providing the certificates uh, within 15 days uh, via email. Uh, Devi Jazzi, if you wish to say something. Uh... I think he is having some issues. Uh, so I think we can yeah. conclude the session for uh, now. So happy Holi and Namaste to all of you. Thank you so much Bye for, to all for, of you. for being here.